Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Reva's, Revo's Future Gazers Continued webinar. Following on from the reinvigorated Centre Managers Conference, Retail Destination Live, we welcome our members and non-members to a panel discussion focused on our industry's future. Guided by those influencing, leading, managing, analysing, and of course, inspiring our shopping places. Today, you can expect hyper-convenience, the sharing economy, brand as a community, and so much more to be addressed, examined, and dissected by our lead panel. The webinar will be recorded, so I encourage you to sit back and soak up as much as you can and have your questions at the ready to be inputted via Q&A at the bottom um, that will be addressed at the end if we have time. So speaking of our lead panel, I'm honoured to welcome you all here today. It would be great if we could go around the virtual roundtable just to quickly introduce ourselves. So hi, I'm Kaylee Buxton. I'm the Marketing Events Manager of Revo. Now I'd like to pass over to Ibrahim, our host. Um, I'm going to pick on you first. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Ibrahim. I'm the Managing Director of Portland Design. We're a place strategy and retail design business working across um, the whole globe, really, um, with, with um, asset owners and occupiers. Um, Emma? Hi, everybody. I'm Emma Hines. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Eurofund, uh, owner and investor of um, retail assets uh, in Europe and now in the UK. Fantastic, thank you. Robert? Hey, I'm Rob Jewell, the Managing Director for Axis Retail Partners. Uh, we are also investing uh, on the continent and in the UK, um, a boutique investment and asset management operating partner. Um, and uh, as a company, we have a huge conviction in retail and uh, look forward to talking about it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Amna? Hi everyone, I'm Dr Amna Khan. I'm a Senior Lecturer in Consumer Behaviour and Retailing. I've been teaching retailing to retail managers for over a decade. I also research in consumer behaviour and I'm an expert contributor to mainstream media. Fantastic. And last but definitely not least, Catherine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine Lambert. Um, I'm currently working with Savills Retail Management and we manage over 200 shopping centres in the UK at the moment including the large uh, previous into portfolio. So we so from small to large scale. Um, and I have over 25 years experience in this industry. So I'm, I'm probably going to be um, answering some of the questions that our centre teams um, have placed to their heart on uh, how they're going to, to operate in the new environment, in the future environment. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. So thank you all. I'm now delighted to pass back over to Ibrahim. Thank you, Kaylee, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be with us this morning. And um, we had a wonderful session at the physical conference. We covered some great subjects around new revenue models, around social value, localism, uh, repurposing shopping centres, and the convergence and blending of physical and digital. And um, we could have spoken on for hours and hours, so we thought we'd do it again. And we've got four great subjects to cover today. Um, which we planned to cover originally and we didn't have the time. Um, the first is the future of public realm. And I'm going to jump straight into that. And each subject I'm going to introduce with a bit of a provocation um, to get the kind of juices flowing. So public realm. Well, I think there's, there's kind of two things going on at the moment um, that I think are going to impact public realm. And I want to get some opinions on this. Um, the first is the the increasing fragmentation of work and how work is not just about working from home and working in the office. We're gonna be working everywhere, anywhere uh, to respond to a new dip in, dip out culture of work. And the second insight is the explosion of quick commerce where our, our audience can order anything from anywhere and get it delivered to them. So how are these two things, um, as well as um, the, the, the future digital realm, augmented reality, virtual reality, the provocation is how will these impact public realm? What is our view about the future of public realm um, and how will that kind of begin to blend with tenanted space? That's the provocation. Rob, how about you starting us off, please? Sure, yeah, thanks. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great question. And um, when you say public realm, to me, that means uh, a social gathering place. So it might be in a public environment, might be in a private environment. And I think that goes to the, to the core of really 
you know, how do we define it and how do we fix it? You know, that I intimated there that has to be a combination of public and private cooperation and coordination. Um, but ultimately, you know, when it comes to people choosing where they want to spend their time, they will vote with their feet. And if there are if there is a misalignment of one space being wholly different to another on the doorstep, they don't care who owns that space. It's all about actually curating that to, to ensure you've got a seamless journey through, you know, an environment, whether it be a retail office um, or just a place to, to, to hang out. So I think, you know, Future Public Realm to me is about, you know, master planning, uh, about coordinating with, with both public and private sector um, and looking at a destination not as a red line around a building, but actually around the wider context outside of your physical ownership and, and you know, not having a, you know, a, disagreements and some friction between those two ownership boundaries actually having a, a coordination and i think that the probably the best examples of seeing that done are where you do have a critical mass of ownership you know where you have a an estate or a campus approach to to real estate you know you have a physical building but then also you have the same owner who owns the building the, the landscape outside and they've created parks and um and they've curated the the mix of uses with offices and, and residential hotels etc so that, that's the best example of one ownership. So if you have that in mind as your vision, think of yourselves as one over, e owner, even though you have a fragmented ownership, I think that has to be the, the approach all those stakeholders would be taking. Um, and I think probably just to finish up on that, probably where the, the worst example of that perhaps might just be the your typical high street, where you have a single ownership, not of a, a shopping centre, which in itself is quite big, but you have a individual shop units owned by potentially passive investors and a whole complex of different uh, different motivations so there's no cohesion cohesion there's no joined up thinking um and this is where perhaps on the back foot you have the councils and, and local bids trying to join you know to create the gel between those environments but um that fragmented ownership ultimately you know does does cause the issue we have on the high streets today Thanks, Rob. And you make a very good point about this shift from uh, what, what I refer to as a hermetically sealed box that looks inward when we're talking about shopping centres to one that is connected and blurred with the with the, old, the urban grain, with the public realm and how it be, can become much more connected. I think that's a good point you make. Catherine, how do you what do you think about this subject? Gosh, it covers several from my point of view. Um, number one will be uh, how do we refurbish going forward? Um, traditionally, we've all spent millions of pounds re-looking at um, the common parts of, of uh, properties that we own. Um, and uh, together with the council, there's a, there's, they're looking for joint funding, etc. But I think in the future, it, it, we should really be looking more like um, wallpapering uh, instead of the big plan preventative maintenance that costs an awful lot of money perhaps a lighter touch of wallpapering areas um, so that we can change the environment more frequently um, and therefore connect with the community more. Um, the, you've got a, a lot of, on the ground, um, we are looking an awful lot at how we link with museums um, and cultural societies to start bringing in joint displays into areas and joint displays into the outside of our area, like Anthony Gormley, Gormley statues I've, we've got in one shopping center, of where do we place them? Uh, we're funding it, uh, or I shouldn't say I'm funding it, obviously the clients are funding, funding it, but that we're exploring down those sorts of routes. Um, and, uh, I think also you were talking about, Rob, Rob touched on how do we manage some of those public realms, especially as um, we're facing an awful lot of our local authorities are strapped for funds. Um, we've already had quite a few that uh, are close to government warnings. <laughs> they don't have the money. Um, yet at Bracknell and Liverpool One, we have actually managed to work with the local authorities so that our security guards have special licenses so that they can go out and police these areas because if the public doesn't feel safe, especially in the night economy, um, this needs to be addressed uh, because people just don't want to come out and socialize as, as Rob is pointing out. So uh, work, 
that's interesting. Um, I think you've seen quite a few centres now looking at um, how they can offer a WeWork type space uh, within their environment. Uh, a lot more areas for uh, increased Wi-Fi and digital use. We can retrofit now um, at, at very low costs, especially with the beacons. Um, I can go on and on. Uh, so uh, on the quick commerce, uh, the one area that we've noticed that's really impacted our management from, from COVID and it's continuing to do so is a sort of delivery service for all of our restaurants. And we don't really have built into the facilities of the public realms, that's the local authority as well as private landlords, areas for these guys on bikes and mopeds and things like that pretty much like you do with a big centre where you're managing tourism. You have an area for the bus bus drivers to be in that they can um, have facilities uh, from toilets. I mean, that seems to be a big issue with a lot of the delivery guys. <laughs> they have, I'm sorry, it's very basic. But I do think these sorts of public realm facilities need to be incorporated in both the, pub, in both the local authority on the high street as well as in, in shopping centers. So I've probably talked enough. You can, <laughs> you can come back to me if you like. Thanks, Thanks Catherine. And your point about, you refer to it as wallpaper, but I like the idea of thinking about public realm, either commercial or non-commercial, being much more programmable and event driven and less and less about fixed kiosks, something that keeps um, uh, public realm areas much more kind of ephemeral and and always new. I think that's really interesting. I think that's absolutely the way to go. Emma, I, I can't see you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, sorry, you're actually getting. I've had to come onto my mobile phone because I, I couldn't get some uh, couldn't connect on audio. But uh, so you're just seeing you're just seeing my name as opposed to the person. But anyway, um, happy to uh, happy to come in on that point and. Uh, Look, I think, um, you know, both Catherine and Rob absolutely, you know, on point with the with the challenge. Um, you know, we're, we're great at sort of master planning our space. Um, I mean, the businesses I've always worked, worked with and worked for, it's all about sort of bigger master plan. We start from the master plan um, perspective and, uh, and, and really, you know, the projects that we're working on, on now, the live projects, are, it's all about how can you bring the outside in and how can you take the inside out? Um, to uh, to really sort of connect um, both the shopping centre space with with public realm space. So I think you know all of the points that have been made are absolutely you know accurate. Um, and there are some fantastic examples of not just big retail spaces um, that are that have been sort of engaged in in place making exercises over the last few years, but also smaller community spaces, smaller retail spaces, and and residential. Where I've also seen you know event driven spaces for the community now popping up in um in residential areas uh, largely residential areas with some sort of community retail um and also if you're looking at um commercial properties today as well uh, i mean you know we talk about the public ground but but where does public become private everything seems to be much more blended today and i think that's what we're sort of working towards to to create much more interesting um, places, destinations where people just want to come and enjoy space um, and uh, which are including event spaces, which are including well-being spaces as well. Lots of, you know, um, well-being sports or, or um, activities that are happening. Um, and I think even more so through COVID, I think there's been a real opportunity and some really creative, you know, ideas flowing to, to bring communities together and retailers to connect retailers with the communities in outside spaces. So I think it's it's actually given us uh, not a blueprint as such, but the opportunity to to even progress and, and to take um, you know the what, the curation of the interior space to the exterior as well. Uh, and just the final you know point I'll make on that is, is with food and, and beverage and restaurants and um, and actually again through the, over the last couple of years really seeing. Um, the food and beverage uh, businesses come to life outside and now they're sort of remaining and those spaces are remaining and creating a much more pleasant um, exterior experience when you're when you're shopping and when you're out and about in town centres. So I think a uh, lot still to to go after, but certainly, um, you know, lots of great examples that have been happening in placemaking over the last few years. 
That's great, and that's really insightful. And, and I, I, I agree in terms of the event-driven comment. And <clears throat> we're finding the the key challenge is to is to really define exactly what type of events that respond to the local local audience, local catchment, what people are interested interested in, what brands and influencers they're following. And we're using a an amazing tool actually that maps social media to really determine how we can curate these spaces and 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 bring relevant type of programming programming and events to the to the any given asset. So I think your point is, is a great one. Let's move on to the second point, or the second question. And my provocation this time is a stat, actually. And the, the second subject is retail spaces as learning spaces and brands as community. And I really believe that, um, and we're looking into this really, really kind of deeply, how can we have, how can we use brands and how can we identify brands that drive social value, the S in ESG? And I think brands have a big role to play in that. Um, and therefore the stat and the provocation is one third of people are interested in attending a lifestyle class at their favorite store. A very important piece of research by Unibail Damco Westfield. Um, and really wanted to kind of understand people's view about the new notion of the store, a store as community, a store space. And, and of course that plays into the whole kind of consumer behavior uh, side of things in terms of their uh, expectations. And also I think it plays into the new, new kind of um, take on status. Status is no longer about product. It's about stories and learning and connoisseurship. I think that's kind of quite interesting because ultimately consumerism is about one thing and one thing only and it's about status what's interesting is that the nature of status is changing and it's turning into much more about understanding than just owning a product so i i teed that up for you amna because i know that's your kind of area um so yeah give us some insight with your your view on this so um if we think about retailers learning spaces i commented for the media in December of 2020 about the Trafford Centre and what was going to happen with that space. And one of the things that I mentioned was retailers now need to start thinking about how they engage and involve consumers and how they think of their brands as spaces where consumers learn more about the products they sell, but also the skills that come with using their products. So usage is as, is, is as important as the actual ownership of the product. And the reason why learning is important in retail spaces is because it increases involvement and engagement and relationships with the brand itself. Now, if we think of a space which is a learning space and consumers are upskilling themselves, you're co-creating something. And that co-creation actually leads to a sense of accomplishment for a, a consumer. And when you can build that relationship with the consumer, you're more likely to get them to stay and you're more likely to get them to be loyal and you're more likely to get them to purchase more so that in essence the learning space actually creates more value and you can see this in retail spaces apple has done this for years where they've actually turned their space into a learning space and they connect with not only the consumer but the wider community where they're actually bringing students in and, and children in from local schools and teaching them about coding and skills related to technology coding is not necessarily their area that they're selling their products in, but their products actually do involve coding because you could use their products for that purpose. By my local high street, I've noticed that there's a lot of stores that are opening which are looking at sustainability and how you can repair and um, recover an item, especially related to fashion and upskill consumers in that space because textiles and creating products and garments was once the heritage of the UK. We were known for it in the industrial revolution time. And that sort of heritage has been lost over time and generations. And what this store does, it's a, it's a small store, a local trader that brings in consumers and teaches them. And all of the floor format is about teaching and learning. You've got sewing machines, you've got fabrics in there. And this psychology behind this is, is this sense of achievement, accomplishment and reward. And that is what keeps consumers coming. At the moment, our space is in retail about transactional. So it's all about buy something, move on. If you really wanna to move to relationships, you need to think about how you're engaging and involving the consumer in the whole brand and the value proposition that you give to a consumer and offer to them. And until that turns to a, a more long-term perspective of, of the consumer and the relationship that you want with them, that's not going to change. 
So I think re retail learning is a really key aspect of how brands can really build engagement with consumers. And you know that consumers are learning in other spaces about brands anyway, whether that's online forums or through brand communities. Now, there is a discussion about whether mixed spaces should be used in retail. So, for example, we already know that doctors and dentists are coming into spaces such as into retail physical spaces. Do I think that um, retail spaces should be turned into lecture theatres and seminars? I think that's much more debatable because I think the concept of education, it, depending on which context of education you're looking at, so, for example, I'm, I teach in a university, that's much more theoretical. If that was to come to a retail space, I, I, would, I would question that based on the differences in education. But if you're looking at vocational courses that support the retailers in your retail space, I think there's definitely an argument for that for short courses versus long term courses that I teach, say, for example, for three or four years. So there is a debate around whether the whole of the retail space should change or whether that should be brand led. I'm from the position that it should be brand led should be about the shops and should be about the consumers and connecting with the consumer. Thanks, Anna. And on your point and a, a bit of an insight, if, we, if people haven't heard of this, there's a, a brand called The New Working Class and they are taking up retail space to give lifelong learning and they're collaborating with colleges. And the first site, my understanding, is, is in the Whitgift Centre with Westfield. So check that out. There's a guy, a guy called James Scoggs, good mate of mine, and he sets up this, this thing called uh, New Working Class. Really, really interesting. Um, Emma, what do you think about the idea of um, learning spaces and brands as communities? Yeah, I, I think um, I think certainly you know our centres um, for me uh, are um, prime spaces to be bringing together consumers with uh, with our retailers and our brands, and not just retailers that are in the scheme, but also brands coming in experiential brands uh, to take occupation just on a, on a short-term basis. And again, if I, if I sort of return to some of my past working, I you mean, know, you've mentioned Westfield, URW Westfield, but, you know, great, fantastic curators of, of space, um, experiential experiences um, with brands coming into the centres and with the, with the retailers themselves. So um, I think, again, it's all about, you know, we've talked about it um, throughout both discussions, but it's about, uh, reimagining the space and, and master planning the space again uh, differently to how we would have envisaged when sh our shopping centres were first sort of conceived many years ago uh, but bringing in sort of more entertainment zones and creating experiential entertainment space within the centres themselves um, and I think you know there's definitely opportunity to to host sort of workshop style uh, courses as, as Anne said you know not something that that's going to be you know it, it, Attracted, but but certainly um, you know small, more sort of private experiences for um, you know for connecting our, our customers with with our brands. Where I think there is a big opportunity is more online and, and actually connecting, therefore, the physical with the digital space. And you know, I still feel you know there's there is a lot of progress. A lot of progress has been made in terms of. Um, you know, digital apps and, and our websites and, and again, just just you know, taking forward um, our services and our communities into the digital space, but it's still very passive. Um, and I think there are you know, great examples of, of other businesses and other sectors that are actually connecting their customers, um, you know, with their consumers um, and their clients. And, it, it, you know, if I just take one example that I was sort of looking into, which was just art, for example, and art gallery spaces and it may seem a little bit strange to be, be speaking of this but you know great online digital art um services whereby they have their their galleries they have their investors and their customers and their artists and they actually you know today with technology um you can create private rooms obviously but but literally connecting you know the artists directly with the the investors and the and the customers um, and I think I, I saw some examples again of shopping centres through again I'll come back to COVID because uh, one thing you know COVID really um, allowed us to to express was was you know our spaces online um, and I did see some you know some great examples of um, showcasing retailer product um, you know um, interviews with retailers in the online space to to bring you know more content to uh, to our customers and, and communities so. I think um, you know, we have the space to do it. We need to probably you know, remaster some of our space to create sort of better um, 
uh, event spaces within within our sort of destinations. And I do think there's a lot of work that can still and progress that can be made digitally and, and connecting the physical with the digital space as well in creating that community online. I think if I could jump in as well, Ibrahim, that there's a commercial benefit uh, to a lot of these retailers and, and FMB operators. You know, these they're not fully utilised 100 percent of the time, these spaces. So a restaurant will have quiet periods on a, on a rainy Monday afternoon or what have you. So I think there's a, there's a commercial benefit to, to utilising those spaces better with community groups, schools, what have you, to, to use their skill set and their infrastructure in a downtime it's not necessarily charging lots of money for it but it's building brand loyalty and it's bringing footfall to their place who may then come back and and uh, visit as a paying customer so i think there's there's a way to be you know smarter about utilization of this space whether it's you know a restaurant operator or even a retailer um and i think and then stepping up into perhaps our role as a landlord um in nirvana for us would be sort of aggregating all of those opportunities to to use the retailers we have under our um in our basket uh, of, of, of uses sharing with our local community because you know you have a national brand who has lots of relationships with different um catchments around the uk or beyond whereas you know the owner of st george's and harrow which we do we should know our customer better than most people so then we should connect with that customer better and if we can aggregate um, all of those offers and education opportunities from around our retailers and our, our F&B operators share it with our stakeholders, then it's quite a virtuous circle. And, uh, you know, we then truly become that community center and, uh, and upskilling and, and giving people opportunities to, you know, to do things outside of uh, just shop. And thank you. And, and I just want to add one on this point and where this is all coming from, we believe, and that is there's a fundamental change in consumer behavior. Consumers know more about products than any sales assistant will know from the research they can access, the information they can access. And therefore, it's incumbent upon brands to add something else to that experience and create community. And I think otherwise, brands will become you know, into the commodity game. And I think that's partly what's driving all this. Um, um, the next subject is a subject actually that I really get into uh, in my in my book. Uh, a really really um, crude uh, um, a crude plug here. Um, um, Future ready retail um, available in all good bookshops. But <laughs> the subject is um, hyper convenience, and I'll start with a stat, um, which again is quite a provocation. 63% of global consumers are willing to pay more for simpler experiences, Siegel and Gale. As we live increasingly complex, digitized lives, we crave uh, experiences, we demand experiences that are simpler, that are intuitive and devoid of complexity. The one um, thing, one type of experience that will, will, will turn customers away increasingly is complex, any, any uh, uh, experience that's, that's complex. Um, we can see increasingly even a queue is anathema now in retail. So this idea of, of, of hyper convenience, how do we begin to sort of bring this into our, our centers, into our assets? And what, what, is, what is the kind of, you know, um, your views about this um, and, how, and its importance? How about you, Catherine? How, what do you think about this? Yeah, um, very interesting topic. Uh, I think on simple experiences, um, I'm quite basic in the sense of um, what do people want to do locally? And I'm finding that, uh, for instance, Sweaty Betty do free yoga classes. That, that attracts me. Um, I've got, you've got cooking, as Rob mentioned, some of the restaurants are offering cooking classes. Um, that attracts me. Uh, my husband wants to do art classes, uh, or preferably pottery. Um, and also, I've been looking at some of the courses that our local universities or tech colleges offer. Uh, and the short courses all seem to be in church halls or some really awful locations, in my view. Um, you know, so again, these are. I think if you have a look at what your local community are, are asking for leisure-wise, then you've already made the experience a lot simpler. I mean, certainly paying on and not having queues. I mean, that's with the 
uh, web facilities, the digital online, I mean, that should be disappearing anyhow. Um, though I will say Marks and Spencers on one, in one of, one of my shopping centres is losing a load of money because they've turned it all to, you know, you scan your own on the tills and walk out, but they've put the booze section ne right next to the, those uh, scan your own. So people are like scanning one bottle and putting the other in their bag and, <laughs> and walking out. <laughs> so there is some way to go on this simpler, you know, uh, economy um i and i also don't think when anyone goes out to a location they don't want to be bombarded with adverts from all the, the retailers around them i mean i've had quite a few people come and try and sell me the latest um it vision which is if they put beacons everywhere or they put what this what what we're now looking at is mesh it's a web mesh across the whole that interconnects lots of systems. Um, and we are going to experiment with it in the UK. Uh, but they don't want to be bumped. And the sales pitch is, oh, well, all your retailers can actually put their adverts on it. And as someone walks past the area, they can get a ping as to what coffee or what half price meal is. And I'm not sure that the consumers want that. Um, because I would certainly be annoyed if I were pinged a hundred times. If I, yeah, if I'm going down to buy something, I've, I've researched it on the web, but I just wouldn't mind having a look at it first. Mm -hmm. um, so no, perhaps, no. sorry. I, no, no, I'm just going to jump in and just say that I, I agree with you that consumers don't want to be bombarded because already consumers are getting over 3,400 messages a day in very different forms of advertising or stimuli. And that's just going to compound that even more. Um, and I, you know, I agree that the academic researcher from 2013, Rosa did some work and looked at this notion of social acceleration, which we're talking about when we talk about hyperconvenience, where technology has facilitated this faster pace in life, whether that's Amazon Prime or Broadband, where the pace of life, where mothers, for example, like myself, are juggling a lot more activities, which makes us feel like we're socially accelerated. And then social change itself, where we look at liquidity of relationships, where we think about jobs aren't for life anymore, or whether we think our identities aren't for life anymore, or our relationships aren't for life anymore. And all of these things are leading to social change and acceleration in a much more faster speed than we've ever experienced as consumers which naturally makes us time poor convenience craving and now consumerism sort of takes off now I know we've already mentioned about delivery and how we you know trying to grapple with our retail spaces and how we can make that more efficient for not only the consumer but also the delivery fulfillment pr processes but for me, the future of retail is really about how we're using technology, whether that's in the form of robotics or whether that's in the form of drones for delivery fulfillment for the future. And how our spaces, such as the roofs of our buildings, turn into places where we are takeoff and landing places or whether they become, um, you know, lockers where things are coming in. And I mentioned that within the presentation I talked about at a Revo conference. But I want to take that one step further where I looked at a case recently from Gen UK and what Gen UK do is overnight in car boot deliveries to field workers and what they do is they deliver to their car boots because they're field, field workers they don't want to spend their time looking for goods looking for parts or, or be more efficient so when they wake up in the morning their stocks within their van and then they're ready enough to go and that is the future of how delivery fulfillment will happen but let's not forget convenience comes at a price it's at a cost it's not free and as we walk into one of the most significant cost of living crises that we have ever witnessed, how many consumers are going to be thinking about the future of the delivery and having a robotic or a drone or an in-boot car delivery right now? My answer is, if you're talking about the next 18 to 24 months, that is simply not going to happen. Because inflation, Goldman Sachs actually said yesterday, we're heading for 20% inflation. We already know the 1st of October is going to be crippling for most consumers, even middle earners, as you know, it's already been discussed. Even if you're on £40,000, you're going to be thinking about your energy bill as it triples to 80% increases. So what's the consumer really going to be thinking about? Well, the data tells us that already. We've already noticed that consumers are tapping less 
They're using their credit cards less. They're using cash because once it's gone, it's gone. They're also standing at the checkouts and saying, once it gets to 30 pounds, I'm not interested anymore. Stop, stop taking the bill. I want to stop shopping at that point. And, and increase, and what we noticed last week was gift card sales are rocketing as well. Why is that? Because it's easier to buy a gift card than it is to buy a product that might cost you more. You can budget. So we can see the pinch for consumers as they tighten the purses. And we can see that the future of convenience is going to slow down a little bit as consumers start to think about what really matters. Convenience, we've got used to it. We think it's normal. But I think the way that the dynamics are changing within our market, it's going to be a luxury for a little while. Now, another thing I talked about with convenience is autonomous stores and just walk out technology. And this hasn't taken off in the UK as much as it has, for example, in Poland, where Zapka has already opened 50 stores. And that is showing convenience where train stations and shopping centers have got these just walk out technologies. And I think that that will come in the UK within time as consumers start to take on and adopt this form of technology. But again, I go back to my point. Yes, paying and walking out is easy and efficient as a consumer but when you're in the situation that we're in and we're going to be here for a long time we're here for 24 months plus because this recession is going to be deep and that's the reality of the situation so how many consumers will be thinking about the convenience of just tapping and walking out rather than budgeting at least for the next middle middle to term rather than long term and i think that payments will change as they already have, they always evolve. We've, we've noticed how payments have, have moved more technologically driven um, and that, you know, biodata will and, and may be used as a payment method in the future. Um, but right now, I think at the heart of consumers and the future of what's going to happen in the, in, the, in the very near future, we're talking about different discussions when we talk about convenience, in my opinion. Thanks. Amanda. Yeah, I think, I, sorry, can I just jump in on a couple of points there? Um, with the increased energy bill, we are being encouraged to invite a lot more of the older population to sit in our shopping centres during winter months. We're also forecasting just at my just at our office, uh, never mind anywhere else, that we'll have more people coming back to work <laughs> into a heated environment because it costs too much to run. Um, I, yeah, Rob can probably comment on that with uh, his, his Spanish colleagues for, uh, on air conditioning. I think they're all going a bit more into the office because it's too much to run working from home. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I do think we can drive more. If we look at the community side on some of these effects, we can drive more people into our public realms if we open the doors a little more to them. Great, really interesting insight from you, Catherine, in terms of, yeah, people being encouraged to come to shopping centres uh, to keep in the warm. Uh, on the one hand, very worrying, but interesting. And uh, I love your 3,400 messages per day. Um, it'd be good to understand, not now necessarily, but just drop me an email as to where that, that came from, because it'd be really good to kind of have a source for that. Uh, and also your point is a very good point. Yeah, maybe people are not going to pay more as per the stat for convenience. I think I think it's a really good point. Emma, your your kind of thoughts quickly on on convenience. Yeah, very very quickly. I mean, I think a lot has been said already, but I think um, look, I, I, there's still a lot. Again, I, I say I think lots of progress, but still work to be done. I mean, to how do we, again their destination? So how do we incorporate you know simplicity of services? Um, you know, they're big spaces, and again, I still come back to we need to still get some of the basics right, really, and work on the basics, and and that comes back to you know, is there a, a you know, a sufficient Wi-Fi um, service running through the building. Are there, can you charge your Wi-Fi when you're actually, or charge your devices when you're actually sitting in our spaces still? I mean, it's, again, we're, we're working on uh, a new shopping centre, as I said, um, in the retail conference at Silverburn and a work, having just acquired it. So reworking those spaces again um, and making sure that all of those convenience factors are there. And we've had lots of debates about it, but you come back to a lot of our sort of corridor spaces um, taken up by lots of bending and there's some of the bending is of extreme use and, and some of it's also a pleasure for pleasure, but really sort of repurposing those spaces. Um, you know, Emma talked about locker services. I referred to that last time, but just coming back to think about the whole customer journey um, and, and what we can do to make life much more simplistic for, for customers and, and solve, solve some of the kind of challenges that they have in navigating spaces. I'm, I'm 
I was looking at a project when I was working at Westfield, which is how do we take the service to the customer as, as opposed to the customer to the service? Quite a difficult nut to crack in such a large space. And, and maybe you could even you know, reverse that and make that too complicated for the customer. And also, uh, again, maybe not a seamless experience, but looking at all of the, the different services that could be offered for convenience, automotive services when you're in our sort of car park spaces, again, it comes back to, to looking at the asset in the round um, and, 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 you know, the, yes, the new trends and the new, um, you know, demands that we have in life. But, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to still provide better services and connect again the digital with the physical space more effectively in terms of um, information on services and helping people navigate. Um, you know, we could go on again for a long time. I was sort of talking very holistically, but um, but I, yeah, I, I still think opportunity to to simplify the customer journey is there in our shopping centres um, to make the to make the experience you know much you know much more pleasurable. Really, great, thank you. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off piece now to make things interesting. So I got a request from Andrew Marmot to um, pose a question, and Andrew's a good fan, a great fan of my book, so I couldn't refuse. Um, and I just want to know, really, or Andrew wants to know, very quickly, two or three words. And, and if you've got an opinion, great. If you haven't, don't worry. In the future, how are we going to repurpose our car parks as we have less and less need for them? What do you think could be possibly we could use um, uh, the, our car parks for in the future? Um, not necessarily all of them, but part of them, um, because Andrew's doing a piece of research and he'd like some opinions. Um don't worry if you haven't got an opinion at the moment, but just 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 a bit of a kind of curveball. Rob, any thoughts? I think right now it's uh, hyper local services, so no silver bullets here, unfortunately. But you know, storage, dark kitchens, local, yeah. very local fulfilment. You know, with uh, not the last mile, but the last quarter of a mile or the last few hundred meters. So so that sort of you know, again back to utilization of space. There are a lot of times when the car parks aren't being used short term. Longer term, depending on is it a separate car park, is it stuck on the roof of a shopping center, all of the practical complications. But I think longer term, there will be a drift towards uh, whatever is the, the next most valuable use, which is probably residential or offices or, or hotel in the long term. Yeah. I mean, there's one in, in Peckham in southeast London just being taken over by the really local company. That's that's a co-working space and, and kind of bars and entertainment on the roof. So quite interesting mm. repurposing of a multi-story. Catherine, any thoughts on this very quickly? Well, very quickly, I think the news this morning was that electric cars are going to be more expensive to run than petrol, um, which is very interesting because we're also in talk, in talk, I mean, we let some of our car parks to corporate occupiers so that they've got their sales force. You know, it, I'm sure a lot of the centre managers do the same thing. Um, and the corporate occupiers were telling us that they're changing all their fleets the next time they do their changeover uh, to electric cars. So they said they're only going to park in our car park if we've got, you know, proper charging for them. Now, if electric cars are going to be more expensive, then you start thinking, well, maybe I should have a few more of those solar panels on the roof of my car park. You know, the solar panel walkways, mm -hmm. which you can plug your electric car into takes a little longer than the Tesla one that can do it in 45 minutes. But as a landlord, we may be able to offer cheaper electricity for the fleets to be able to run for their um, sales force and therefore link into the business community a bit more. I, I know it's, it's nothing like the scale of what Rob was talking about, how you can repurpose car parks. I mean, that's bigger than my expertise. <laughs> I'm just talking about day-to-day -day operational. Um, the other thing we've been looking at at our car parks is just to make sure that um, uh, we're finding um, due to the aging population, there's a lot more people needing to go and pick up prescriptions and they're getting very upset if they have to pay car parking charges just to walk half an half a hour down to Boots to pick up their prescription and get back in their car. And since there are an over... A, you know, older generation, they, they are strapped for cash. So we're looking at how we can possibly make sure the first 20 minutes or half an hour is free just mm -hmm. for that route and therefore get the buy-in on how we're using our car park and more of a community use. So 
slightly different angle from full scale redevelopment, but how do we use that car park? Um, Emma, any, thank you, Catherine. Emma, any quick thoughts on how we may be able to repurpose car parks in the future? Um, well, yeah, Rob said there's no silver bullet. I think it's got to resonate with the actual location, clearly. Um, every location is different, but, you know, just a few examples of, of repurposing car parks that I've, I've been involved in in the past, uh, and I'm sure many others have as well, is, is you know, car storage um, has been a, a sort of good repurposing of space. Uh, I mean, it really does connect back to automotive at this stage more so, but um, but automotive services, test driving, et cetera, uh, using some of the car park lobbies actually for showcase space. Um, I mean, one example that came up in the, in the conference, um, in the, the live conference was, you know, vertical farming. Okay, car parks being slightly more restricted in terms of height levels, um, but, uh, but something like a vertical farm, for example, not really needing, um, does need some height um, and verticality, but generally just needs space. Um, and so, um, yeah, we've had uh, um, uh, basically, you know, coming back to things like uh, lounges in car parks, uh, business lounges that we've kind of created in lobby spaces before. Um, so all thinking again about the customer journey and what is the customer going to want as they drive into spaces, but entering um, the centre without necessarily wanting to, to, to have the whole experience of shopping in the centre as well. So I think it comes back to... Uh, it's all about the customer. I mean, that's where it has to start, really. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope, I hope that's helpful. Andrew, if you're listening, I'm sure you are. Um, OK, let's move on to, I think, maybe our last subject. We've got uh, just for five minutes. Um, unless, Kaylee, there are some pressing questions from anybody. No, I haven't got any questions in the Q&A. So if anyone's got any, don't miss out. Pop them in now. OK, there's this there's, there's kind of... Get, get on to the next, the last one then. So this subject is, is, is about the sharing economy. And, and the provocation is, um, in the UK, a drill, sorry, could, could go on mute. Thank you. The provocation is, in the UK, apparently, a drill is used for an average of six minutes of its life, only six minutes. Um, Another kind of stat is that there's around 475 pounds worth of goods on average stored in every household in the UK in the attic. Uh, another kind of insight is that for over a decade now, the self-storage business has been growing um, uh, at 10 percent a year. So this is sort of suggesting that we've got too much stuff. We're suffering from stuffocation, as we say. Um, and maybe um, the sharing economy is, is going to finally take off. There's also been seeing the growth of Library of Things, which is an amazing brand. If you don't know it, please check it out. It's, because, it's beginning to appear in shopping centers and, and high streets. Um, so how, what are your thoughts on the sharing economy uh, and how that's going to drive uh, more sustainability, more community, as well as obviously um, value for our, our, um, our, our consumers? Rob. So I own one of those drills, I have to say. Um, I probably sub six minutes as, as we stand. <laughs> um, as soon as I can afford to refurbish my house so that more shelves will be going up and I might get to my six minutes. Um, look, I, I'm probably more speaking as a consumer than, than a, a you know landlord here, but um, I, I think there's a there's a willingness for people to uh, to enter into this kind of relationship with their, their stuff and and their you know community to share things it makes perfect sense when you say it in that in that way um what are the blockers i think there's probably a technology blocker there's there's availability so you probably find people want to drill and people want to give a drill but <laughs> the, the the secret source is trying to connect those two people so you know probably uh, you know above my pay grade to try and to try and crack that nut but um but there's definitely a willingness and i think over time that that will become enabled probably by technology um and uh, and this more you know community focused as as i think societally we're, we're drifting towards um uh, which which can only be a good thing and then i think there is a talk about peak stuff you know the, the chief of ikea said it over five years ago i think we're, we were at peak stuff um a long time ago but people st still seem to be con you know consuming and, and aggregating stuff and uh, uh i did a car boot sale recently for my loft and and it wasn't 400 quid but i, I got a couple hundred quid out of it so uh, i'll support that view as well but 
I'm at peak stuff and uh, there's probably still still a way to go but on a personal level. <laughs> Thank you. Amna, what's your thought on this? I am completely for the sharing economy. Access versus ownership really is the discussion we're having here. Um, and what we can see from the research is that there's been a shift in consumption behaviour to more access-based consumption versus ownership-based consumption, where rather than owning something, you are willing to access it. And that notion is based on the fact that you want to access stuff temporarily. Um, it's fluid in your consumption, but it also ties to the consumer significantly. If we believe that consumers' identities are fluid and they keep changing and evolving, then access-based consumption works perfectly to continually create discard and evolve your identity and your consumption practices. Now, it's hand in hand with sustainability, because if you're accessing things rather than owning them, not only are you allowing them to be put back into the system, but you're allowing more use of that, that item itself. A little example that I like is um, one of the Little Loop. It's a social media based um, sustainability initiative, but also it, it sells, well, it rents toddler items so for example I've had two children and, and your worst nightmare as a mom is not only that they change in size very quickly but then you end up storing lots of goods so they are actually building a solution for that by you rent them you access them you can uh, rent for example a certain number of items and then send them back they're used again but this is also really important for the consumer because if we think about access and rent or consumption for the consumer when you're allowing them access and that access comes at a tenth of the price, for example, if you want to get a Prada dress, you can on Buy Rotation or Her or one of the platforms that sells luxury items, get it for tenth, a tenth of the price. You've also been able to enter another status class through your consumption because you might have not been able to afford to wear Prada or Louis Vuitton or Gucci. But through access ownership and paying 10% of the price, you have access the goods, but also access the social class. So there's a hierarchy based element to that as well. But there's another psychological element for the consumer, which is about satisfaction. Our satisfaction changes with our product after a certain time of using it. And there's research to support that. So when you buy something and it's new, you're really satisfied with it. And over time, your satisfaction sort of wanes and it doesn't feel as good. Now, if you're going to access things and you're going to refresh and change your wardrobe all the time or change your access to items, you're going to get that hit from the satisfaction over and over again. So it's a feel good factor for the consumer, too. Now, if we think about product ownership, that's um, one way of access and ownership. There is all, already access through you know, online communities and channels such as that to sharing of knowledge, sharing of skills, sharing of expertise. Um, so we can see how access has changed, but I'm, I'm all, all for the sharing economy. I think it's a great way of changing consumption patterns. It's a new model of consumption. It is very, very lucrative. We know from the Airbnbs and Netflix of this world that it's a financial model that absolutely works. Um, but yeah, all for it. Thank you, Amna. Thank you. And you're right. You reminded me when you just said a quote in my book, which was something goes, it goes something like the new status symbol is not what you own. It's what you're smart enough not to own which I think really summarises what you're, what you're saying. Emma, any quick thoughts on, on sharing economy? Um, yeah, I think, we've, you know, again, it's a journey. You know, we are, we are already, um, you know, in the process of sharing. I think in the physical space, obviously, co-working is, is the obvious um, um, sort of go-to option. Uh, and that's something that we can successfully bring into our spaces. I think as we're developing more uh, mixed use um, uh, spaces, which is, is something that is, is very sort of hot on the agenda, um, clearly where you have more residents living in uh, sort of smaller spaces, um, apartment blocks, et cetera, there's a big opportunity there to sort of aggregate services and access to product. Um, and whether that services and, and product that, that you can actually, that's in the center itself, that's being provided by, um, by, our, by our retailers, or even in our community, we actually use a lot of maintenance services ourselves. Um, and again, this is, is one that, that could be brought together to actually provide uh, to the wider community on, on a wider basis, particularly where people don't necessarily have big houses with lots of storage. So I think in terms of practicality, those are a, a, you know, a couple of examples. Um, outside of that, I think you know, our business models are still very restricted in terms of um, successfully bringing in sort of, let's just take, for example, rent the run runway or those examples of, of clothes sharing or product sharing, whereby our spaces are, are just typically 
expensive, which is why those models are more successful currently online rather than in the, the physical space. But what I think we can do, and again, it's about the journey, and I've seen some examples of using our common area spaces, and we come back to event spaces, in, in sort of bringing together themed events to drive and bring other community uses into the common area space um, and to drive awareness and to hopefully bring, you know, our community, um, you know, residents and, and people that want to just come and enjoy our spaces, but, but come, to the, come to our destinations for, as for a different purpose and to have that experience. So I think, uh, again, just some practical examples of what is possible now, um, but, but, you know, obviously, this is something a trend that I think is going to progress in the future and it's going to need more work on um, you know on on the part of owners landlords um, operators etc thank you yeah. thank you hi, hi can I just add in it, it's it, it, you're seeing it in pop-up shops mm. more than permanent for instance we've got quite a few pop-up shops at the moment selling second-hand school uniforms mm. which yeah. the local community or you know, so we're not coming up with the idea, but we are allowing it into our mouths via short term lets and pop ups. Um, and I like the secondhand uniform um, company that set themselves up. Uh, the, uh, another one I've seen is is um, on sort of food banks, but not food banks as you normally know. It's, it's the availability to buy food, but you come with your own boxes and you just fill it up with the cereal um, or craft beer if you come with your own container you can get beer on tab instead of having to buy all the bottled beer but these are pop-ups uh, the only one that I've seen I mean certainly my my children who are all in their 20s out of university they've all got very small flats they can't afford the big furniture and when you when you have uh, so so you can't get rid of any large pieces of furniture However, the British Heart Foundation, they've mm -hmm. not got many, but they are setting up stalls where they will go and collect furniture from probate or older people or downsizing. And it's given back to the community as a recycled mm -hmm. product. And I like supporting that. Um, but again, it's the cost of space, as, as Emma mentioned. Thanks, Catherine. I, th I think we're running out of time now. Kaylee, uh, thank you, Catherine. Has there any any questions appear, Kaylee? Um, no, just a thank you from Andrew <laughs> for asking <laughs> the question. Cool. I'm, I'm glad I got that in. Okay, well, look, thank you so much, everybody. We could you know, go on for ages. Um, and thanks so much for your, your insights and your, and your opinions on these matters. Um, let me leave you with, with one thought. There are three types of people in this world and three types of business leaders. Those that make it happen, those that let it happen, and those that wondered what happened. In this rapidly changing retail landscape, do not wonder what happened. Listen to this panel, they've got some great insight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you everybody.